άρχισε η Οδύσσια μου. Ο Γουλιάδη μου, ο Ερίκος ο Σεβίλιας, ο οποίος ήταν στο Auschwitz με τον αριθμό, πέθανε με τον αριθμό. Ερίκος Σεβίλιας από την Αθήνα. by the Allied advance. This is how they looked when they arrived. Prisoners were loaded into open railroad cars and freighted across the country in winter weather. They died of exposure, starvation, dysentery, typhus.
out of the Bible. They came from Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and France. But when we got the destination to Dachau, there wasn't too many left. How many were there? I didn't count them, but there, there wasn't too many left. Maybe from hundreds of them, maybe there was 200, maybe. How many German guards? Oh, there was ever few feet, there was a German guard. What happened when you arrived in Dachau? Well, they took us, they pushed us in there, and they pushed us in a barrack. And we, in a way, we were glad we got into a destination that we can rest our feet. And uh, in the morning, they brought us a little food. We, and we sat there, and there wasn't too much to do. There was just a holding camp. And there was a big turmoil. And we knew, we knew, we saw a lot of people in the barracks. And we didn't know what happened, and we saw the guards and everything. And then a few days later, maybe a week, two weeks later, I don't remember, because at that point, we were numbless. And the deliberation was a very emotional thing. What, what was the turmoil about? The turmoil, Pete, from the barracks, the Germans were running back and forth. There must have been some. We heard airplanes. We heard shooting. So we knew something is going on, but we didn't know what. But the barracks were electrocuted. The, the, not the barracks, the, um, the camps were dynamited. And they, later we found out it was dynamited. If they, 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 they could, the Americans caught them by surprise, they come early. They expected them to come sometimes late May, and they come earlier and uh, they opened the gate. And they didn't have a chance to push the button. They didn't want to leave a, tra a, tra a trace of to see for the world what happening. We had no road, red cross, we had nothing. And then the Americans, those poor guys, some of them were kids themselves, 17, 18 years old. They passed out, they cried. Their tears were running down their cheeks. And they didn't know what to do with us because they didn't expect to see such horrible things. Box cars for dead people with their eyes and their mouth open, skeletons, people burning in the gas chamber, in the crematoriums. It was unbelievable. And we vista, we could hardly go out in the, in the yard to see the Americans. And they told us some Americans were speaking Yiddish, they were Jewish soldiers, and they assured us, don't worry, you are free, we'll help you. We'll try and do our best, they assured us. But to my disbelief, I never thought this would happen. They give us, they share the rations with us. And I thank God, I, my constitution was strong enough. I knew better not to eat that food because a lot of people grab the food and they eat it and it, could be, it broke out an epidemic of dysentery. And um, a lot of people died of dysentery because their stomach, their system was shrunk. They couldn't digest that food. And so in a day, two days later, they brought in a stuff. They couldn't cope with the people. They had people dying like flies on them. So they brought in a medic stuff and they put up on the, in, on the grass. They had some grass there. They put up some on the grass tents with cards, and they took the people, they disinfected the us, they cleaned us up, and they gave us German uniforms, which we hated it like poison, but we had no choice because we had no clothes. And they started giving us the food like for little birds, small portions in very not rich food, and they saved a few people. And then later on, we got a little bit on our feet. We made a, and we started making a life for ourselves. 
And on the day of liberation, I met my husband. And he didn't met me out of love. We were lonely. We had no one to talk to. And I looked like hell on earth. I did towards the anti-developed moms. And I, was, and I was just like a dress skeleton, like I said before in the interview, like a dress skeleton, blue skin. And my head was to a side, swollen up. And there was nothing to fall in love with, but we just, to help each other. So we start, if, and uh, when we had a little, then we got a little free, they give us some clothes and we went out and we talked and then we left the camp. Remember how you met your husband? He was looking for family and I was looking for family. And we met. We got through the gates at Dachau. The SS gods. <laughs>
final chapter of the war in Europe. After four years of fighting, which saw almost 27 million Soviets killed, the Red Army entered Berlin. This is the Reichstag, a building which became a symbol of the Third Reich. And as the Nazi regime crumbled, it would also become a target. On the 25th of April, the Red Army encircled the city and began its slow advance to the centre. Staring defeat in the face, the Nazis became desperate, forcing civilians, even children and old men, to fight. Those who refused were executed. But none of that would help save the Reich, and on the 30th of April, Hitler committed suicide. Two days later, the German capital had fallen and the symbols of Nazism were brought crashing down. A force that had at one time threatened to conquer the entire continent had been defeated. The war in Europe was over. So we didn't get too much sleep and we used to just get out real early in the morning because in the barracks it was just crying and screaming and praying and it wasn't unusual that a prisoner who was laying next to you to go to sleep when you woke up they were dead. In any of these camps everything is so the same day in and day out that when anything unique happens that is not on the schedule you always immediately try to talk about it. Is this good news or bad news? One morning we came out and the first thing we saw was that there are no guards in the guard towers. So we are sneaking between the barracks towards the gate and lo and behold, nobody's there. So we get enough courage to go to the gate and we notice there's a heavy chain with a padlock on it and it's a very, very foggy morning and we are just dumbfounded. All of a sudden there's a break in the fog like a mirage and all you see is two horses with a horseman. As he's coming closer one of the Polish kids says to me look at his hat and it was a red star, a Russian soldier. He comes to the gate and he says I'm advance guard, nobody can leave the camp because there are all sorts of diseases, you're full of lice and you haven't been washing for months. But he says, as he takes out his gun, shoots off the padlock, doctors will be coming, medication will be coming, food will be coming very shortly. So the three of us, as fast as our skinny legs can carry us, we go to every barrack 
in the vicinity, open up the door and every language that we know, just yell in, we are free, we are free. And you'll never forget that moment, the sounds from the barracks. Those who are able to walk out to the sunlight, walk out. Those who can't walk are crawling out. I have to pass through a little area where there are little bungalows. And this is where the SS families were staying. And they must have left in a big hurry because I go into one of the bungalows and I open up the closet, the clothing in there. Open up the pantry, food. And then I go into the bathroom and I turn on the water, hot water, fluffy towels, shampoo, soap I haven't seen for a year. I make a little victory dance on my prison uniform, get in there and take my first hot shower in a year. It's wonderful.